Good afternoon and welcome to the call meeting of the Board of Regents of Del Mar College convening at 12 noon on Tuesday, August 28th, 2018. We do have a quorum, so I will call the meeting to order and we will begin, please, with a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, Gabe, would you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today is uh, the very beginning of the semester for Del Mar College, so it's uh, always great to see all the excitement on campus. Again, after the, uh, the slower time of the summer, and it's also a great time to read together our mission statement as we're reminded about all the activities, not only of the board, but why we're really here uh, for the college and the students. So please join us. Del Mar College provides access to public education, workforce preparation, and lifelong learning for student and community success. And as a reminder, Del Mar College is streaming the live audio and video from its official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting as considered closed session by statute. And as a reminder, please be sure to silence your cell phones or other electronic devices. Um, we have a, a fairly full agenda uh, today, uh, Regents and a closed session, but I want to rearrange the agenda slightly. Uh, to help make it the flow a little better. We're going to actually uh, defer item one for several, uh, a little further in the agenda. We're going to start with items two, three, four, and five. And with that, I'm going to invite to the podium Mr. Raul Garcia, our CFO, to cover item number two, discussion and possible action related to the order of the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District, the 2018-19 maintenance and operations budget, and the 2018-19 debt service budget. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, and members of the Regent. Uh, so today we're going to go over the slides that we discussed in public uh, session last week, August the 20th. And I'm just going to go with a high-level overview only because <laughs> there has not been any changes since our last presentation. So I want to be respectful of your time, okay? All right, so here's a presentation that talks about our proposed revenues uh, for the <coughs> operating and maintenance. At the end of the day, we are looking to uh, propose a budget of $100.4 million, <coughs> which is $2.8 million or $2.9 million over last year's $97.5 million. Nothing has changed since last week's presentation. Uh, so as we talked before, uh, our uh, increase uh, or our change is going to be invested uh, in uh, our salaries specifically to fund our operations and our strategic initiatives. Here's a little bit more of a breakdown of our salaries and benefits by category and then our non-salary uh, our increase over last year is 698,000 predominantly in some uh, predominantly in our campus police initiative, uh, insurance, casualty insurance, and also our election, which is uh, uh, unique to this year. Moving right along, Mr. Chairman, would you, uh, would you like for me to talk about the, our debt service budget? Yes? Okay, sure. absolutely. All right, so uh, this year uh, we're looking to ask is for $18,000, $565 in our debt service budget. These funds will be used uh, to fund our general obligation bonds, specifically for our recent uh, initiative for capital projects. Uh, as you can see here, year over year for the last three years is trending uh, fairly uh, similar. All right, now I'm going to open up for any questions that you may have. Do we have any questions, Regents, on the uh, proposed budget? As has been noted, it's uh, the same that we've been seeing, but this is the last step in our process to approve our budget. Okay. Hearing none, we'll have a motion to approve the budget. Do you, do, oh, you need me to go straight into three? Yes. Okay, so let's do three and you read that. Oh, okay. 
Got it. So you should have in your packet um, the proposed order approving the budgets for 2018-2019 regions. Uh, and it is our custom and practice to read those into the record for the public's sake. And so for your consideration is an order of the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District budgets 2018-2019 be it ordered by the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District that whereas budgets for the Del Mar College District have been prepared and submitted to the Board of Regents of the District in the manner required by law and whereas a meeting has been called and held as a public hearing for the purpose of considering the adoption of a maintenance and operation budget and debt service budget after public notice of said meeting as required by law and whereas all taxpayers and other persons of the district desiring to do so have been given the opportunity to be present and to participate in such hearing Therefore, that certain budgets presented to the board at this meeting and filed among the official documents of this district be, and it is hereby adopted as, <coughs> the budgets for the Delmar College District for the fiscal year beginning September 1, 2018 and ending August 31, 2019. There is customary language indicating uh, uh, who offered the motion and seconded it, and then um, the designation for the roll call vote, as well as the customary signatures of the chair and secretary. Now do we have a motion for the order? Absolutely, Mr. We have motion. I think we had a second from Ed Bennett. Uh, any further discussion by Regents? Any public comments on item number two? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote, please. Dr. Adame? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Mrs. Strada? Yes. Ms. Hutchinson? Yes. Mr. McCampbell? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Now item number three, discussion on possible action related to the order of the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District tax rates for 2018-2019. Okay, so our slides that we have here today is has not changed whatsoever from our August 20th presentation. It's very consistent. Uh, it is consistent. It is the same. Um, we're asking for your approval on a proposed budget for <coughs> our maintenance and operations of 54656 Actually, the approval for the effective rate of 0 0.198909, which will yield 54657608 Those dollars will be used to fund our operations as well as our uh, annual debt service for our revenue bonds. All right. Our second request is the approval for the proposed debt service tax rates. Uh, our uh, tax rate here will be 0 0.072192 for every $100,000 of appraised property value. This will yield the institution $18,565,219. These dollars will be used to fund our capital project funding in the form of general obligations. As you can see here, uh, it's the three year um, is still trending pretty much consistently year over year. All right, total combined rate uh, will be 0.281885. Again, it's trending reasonably the same year over year since fiscal year 2016. Any questions? Any questions, Regents? If not, we'll have all you read the order for this one, please. Again, Regents, for your consideration is a proposed order on the tax rates for 2018-2019 that reads as follows. Be it ordered by the Board of Regents of the Delmar College District that whereas the Board has duly and properly considered a proposal to increase total tax revenues from properties in the tax roll in 2018 by 12.94%, and whereas the board has duly and properly called and held the public hearings required by the Texas Property Tax Code after giving the public notice required by the code and by law, and whereas all taxpayers and other persons desiring to do so have been given the opportunity to be present and to participate in such hearing, and whereas the board has duly and properly given and published notice of these meetings as required by law, now therefore the board hereby approves and adopts a proposal to increase total tax revenues from properties in the tax roll in the preceding year by 12.94%, thereby increasing the total tax rate to be levied for 2018 to 28 and 1885 over 10,000s or 0.281885 cents on each $100 property valuation in the district. 
This tax rate will raise more taxes for maintenance and operations than last year's tax rate. The tax rate will effectively be raised by 5.42% and will raise taxes for maintenance and operations on a $100,000 home by approximately $3.99. Again, there's a customary language uh, indicating uh, a motion and a second, as well as the uh, signature lines. Regents, do we have a motion for the order? Um, Carol Scott, do we have a second? Uh, I think Sandra may have got to that first. Thank you. Um, any public comment on agenda item number three? Hearing none, a roll call vote, please. Dr. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, if I may, sir. Uh, on behalf of this fine institution, I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, uh, our district, and uh, our regent members for uh, helping us fund this year's operations. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think you're the number four and number five also, uh, Mr. Garcia. So uh, item number four, discussion on possible action related to the order of the Board of Regents of Del Mar College District. 2018-19 tax levy of 0.281885 per $100 uh, dollars of taxable value for Delmar College District. It has your name on it. Are we just going straight to the order, Augie, or is something that? Uh, no, I mean, if there's something you want, Mr. Garcia, if you want to tee it up, or I mean, there's a, the, the order is self-explanatory, Mr. Chair, okay. and uh, up for your consideration, board members, <coughs> under this agenda item three is a proposed order uh, formalizing the tax and ordering the tax levy for 2018 of the Del Mar College District. The order reads as follows, be it ordered by the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District that the following taxes are hereby levied for the year 2018 on all property, real, personal, and mixed located within the boundaries of the Del Mar College District and subject to taxation by it for the year 2018 under the laws of this state and of the United States. A total ad valorem tax of 28 and 1885 over 10,000 cents on each $100 property valuation in the district for the purposes and in the specific amounts which follows. Mm -hmm. Paragraph one, an ad valorem tax of 20 and 96 93rd over 10,000 cents or 0 0.209693 on each $100 property valuation for the local maintenance fund of the Delmar College District. And paragraph two, an ad valorem tax of seven and 20, 21.92nd over 10,000 cents or 0 0.072192 on each $100 property valuation for the interest and in sinking fund of the Delmar College District Bonds, Delmar College District Limited Tax Refunding Bonds, Series 2011, Delmar College District Limited Tax Refunding Bonds, Series 2013, Delmar College District Limited Tax Refunding Bonds, Series 2014, Delmar College District Limited Tax Refunding Bonds, Series 2015, Delmar College District Limited Tax Bonds, seri Series 2016, Delmar District Tax Bonds, Series 2017, Delmar College District Limited Tax Bonds Series 2018A and Delmar College District Limited Tax Bonds Series 2018B. Again, there's uh, the provision to note uh, motion and second as well as the uh, necessary signatures. <coughs> That's the proposed order. Regents, do we have a motion for the order? So Dr. Second. Adami, second. By uh, but, uh, Estrada. Okay, we got that one down. Great. <coughs> Any public comments on agenda item number four? Hearing none, a roll call vote, please. Dr. Adani? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Mr. Uh, order carries or motion carries. <laughs> Item number five, discussion of possible action related to the resolution of the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District 2018-19 tax exemptions. And I believe, uh, Augie, we've got another resolution on that. Or order, yes, right? the final resolution in this budget cycle process for you to consider and to prove Regents is uh, the resolution that includes the, <laughs> the different uh, exemptions uh, that, are, that are provided uh, pursuant to law that you need to formally approve. And the resolution for your consideration reads as follows. 
resolution of the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District resolve that for the year 2018, all persons who qualify by law are granted an exemption in the amount of $5,000 of the appraised value of their homestead property and resolve further that for the year 2018, persons of the age of 65 or older are granted an additional exemption in the amount of $50,000 of the appraised value of their homestead property and qualified disabled veterans are granted the statutory exemption and resolve further that for the year 2018, each person under 65 years of age who has qualified for the payment of disability insurance benefits as defined under federal old age survivors and disability insurance or its successor is hereby granted an additional exemption from taxation in accord with section 11.13D of the property tax code, the total amount of which is equal to $50,000 of the appraised value of such person's residence homestead property, as that term is defined by the state constitution and law provided the owner of such residence homestead property or his or her duly authorized agent or attorney applies at the office of the Noises County Tax Appraisal District for said exemption in accord with the requirements established by the tax assessor collector or the Noises County Tax Appraisal District as permitted by law. And resolve further that for the year 2018, each disabled, disabled veteran is entitled to the mandatory exemption provided in section 11.22 of the code. And resolve further that for the year 2018, each qualified charitable organization that has been granted exemption by the city of Corpus Christi is entitled to the tax exemption provided under section 11.184 of the Texas tax code. Again, there's a, a, a space for, uh, to record the motion and the second, as well as the necessary signatures. Question. Do we know what the uh, statutory exemption is for these two uh, disabled veterans and the uh, qualified charitable organizations? I, I don't know off the top of my head. We don't know. Yeah, so yeah, what my understanding, and I've tried to take a deep dive in the state statute, and you know, there's a lot of verbiage, and I'm not an attorney, so it's going to take me a while to get uh, get up to par. But it varies; it's a percentage, and so there's a, a couple of variables that people, uh, these veterans, may qualify under, and so depending on what those variables are, will determine what percentage the discount will be. So it's not the same for everybody. Uh, that is my understanding. Okay. Yes, sir. My other question is, can they qualify or can they get more than one exemption? Like if they meet the 65 and over and, and disabled veteran, well, or maybe, only one one applies? If I may, I'd like to do some fact checking. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's, a combination, that's a combination that's unique to yeah. a, a, a smaller portion, but um, I would say <clears throat> going forth that that all of those that are apply, I think there's mul there there are cases where there are multiple exemptions that where they where they apply for the same property. Yes, yes. But That's we'll right. get that we'll, we'll get that rolled out <coughs> okay. yes, on that I, particular example. And the caveat is that the person taxpayer must be a resident of that property, oh, so yeah. can't right. hold it as an investment and and take advantage of these ex exemptions. This is their home. Got to yes. be their home state. Yeah. Regents, do we have a motion on the order? Uh, by Susan Hutchinson, a second. Uh, several seconds. Uh, I'm looking up at Elva. I'll give it to you, Elva. This time, rotate it around. Great. Uh, any public comment on agenda item number five, the order for uh, related to the tax exemptions? Hearing none, a roll call vote, please. Dr. Sherwood? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mr. Rebus? Yes. Ms. Ness Parker? Yes. Ms. Yes. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Garcia and Augie and everyone who's worked on this. It's uh, sort of the last step in our annual budget and tax cycle and uh, closes out our, a lot of our extra meetings that we have related to this. So thanks to everyone who's been involved. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go on and do number six before we go back up to number one. Six is a discussion of possible action related to the revisions of policy B612 tenure track faculty salary structure section B6.12.1. Tammy McDonald, welcome. Good afternoon. As a result of the adoption of the uh, FY1819 budget requires a policy change to the section for the uh, faculty rate schedule and that section is B6.12.1 and in your packet you had that section that was provided to you a red line version. So uh, since the budget is effective September 1st <coughs> this change would be effective September 1st of 2018 and the faculty uh, tenure tenure track common base would go from 47 
Any questions for Tammy on this? Do we have a motion? I think second. Susan and second by uh, I think Sandra. Any further discussion by Regents? Any public comments on agenda item number six related to the policy change uh, regarding the faculty salary sections? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying yes. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Now that we're done with our board, uh, our budget and tax section, we will go back to the top of the agenda and begin with item number one, um, discussion and possible action related to the internal audit follow-up for reports for purchasing an IT general controls and the FY19 internal audit plan review. Welcome back again. Yes, thank you. As part of our continued efforts to improve the effectiveness of our college processes, we have Elisa Martin and Daniel Graves, both with Weaver, our internal auditors, and they're gonna present the following. We will have a fiscal year internal audit status report for our FY18 year. We will have a follow-up report on the purchasing audit. Um, they will also review our FY19 internal audit plan. And then as uh, shown in the agenda item and also in your packet, the IT general controls follow-up audit that will be presented to you in executive closed session due to the sensitivity and security <coughs> nature of the subject that will be presented in closed session. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, to uh, Lisa and Dan. Good afternoon, Regents. Yeah. Where's my clicker? Ah, I have a clicker. There. Can you see that? It's a little bit faint. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we'll start with the 2018 internal audit plan status and um, as your internal auditor we start the year with a internal audit plan that's approved by you and at each briefing I communicate to you where we are on that plan for fiscal 2018 we had um, an audit over accounts payable and purchasing which was completed and that audit has already been provided to you in its full form we deferred two audits over grant management and over um, information security and we discussed that at the last Regents meeting and then we had some time for additional special projects but we really weren't called in to do any additional projects on behalf of the president's office we also performed follow-up procedures over the prior internal audits that still had um, internal audit findings remaining the admissions and financial aid audits were previously provided to you um, today we're going to talk about the follow-up procedures over the remaining findings of our IT general controls in our closed session we previously had um, communicated the follow-up procedures over human resources and then today we will brief you on the completion of our follow-up procedures to validate the action items from the um, purchasing internal audit that was conducted last year and Dan will be going over those in addition, on an annual basis, we as internal audit evaluate the risk assessment and um, get comfortable that the risks as previously identified and the plans that were previously um, reviewed and approved as part of our risk assessment are still appropriate. So we've done that and um, we will be presenting to you a revised <coughs> internal audit plan for 2019 that is slightly different than <coughs> on what was approved when we approved the three-year plan primarily that's due to the deferrals of the audits into 2019 and then on an annual basis there is a requirement for the college to produce a annual internal audit report and we'll talk to you about the requirements of that report and it's due in November um, and so moving on I'm not sure why that's so large <laughs> um, we did perform follow-up procedures over our IT <coughs> general computer control audit. Um, we produced and um, provided you the findings of our first audit, and really the first audit, over a comprehensive set of, of IT general controls last year. Um, we will brief you on the, the results of that under executive session pursuant to Government Code 552.139. Separately, we performed follow-up procedures over our prior year purchasing audit. In 2017, we performed a comprehensive internal audit over the purchasing function and the cycle and responsibilities for compliance. Um, that audit was conducted and we did have um, internal audit findings, 13 of them. 
This year, a year later, we came in and performed follow-up procedures to ensure that the corrective action that had been um, on management's response was put in place. We did that work in um, May of this year. We completed that work and we were able to um, receive management's further commitments in August. So I'm, the next page has the 13 findings. We had five high risk findings. We had eight moderate risk findings as part of the closure of the prior audit. Of those findings, we found that there was action and corrective um, action on all findings, which is very positive. We were able to completely close as remediated four of them, showing that the actions were placed in service and could be tested as effective. And then there are nine findings for which we, we, would, we have determined them to be partially remediated. And I've asked Dan to go through those nine so that you can get comfort on the amount of partial closure and what's still open on those particular findings. Yeah, so of those uh, remaining open findings, those nine open findings, they all had progress as partially remediated. Uh, the first finding being finding one actually pairs with the last finding in the list, which is finding 13. Um, they both center around segregation of duties within access in the system. Um, we've shown and validated that manages, management has made some progress in implementing controls, but they need to further test the system before they can fully roll it out in the live environment. And so we've given credit for the, the partial remediation and the efforts that they've made thus far. Um, they need more time to <coughs> finalize their testing and then put it in the live production environment so that they can logically, with access in, within the system, separate uh, segregation of duties for, for the purchasing cycle. Um, and that's the general theme through all the different status of implementation is generally they've, they've moved and made progress, they just need more time to mature that process and let it operate effectively. And that continues with finding two, the uses of commodity codes. And so a, as a point of practice and policy for that department, um, or procedure for that department, they have <coughs> required the use of the uniform uh, commodity codes. However, through our testing, we did find some purchase orders that were primarily earlier on in our cycle and our testing that they needed to continue to use and enforce the use of commodity codes uh, through the purchase that helps them in the end um, actually track <coughs> vendor compliance and some of the other compliance aspects of purchasing that we'll talk about in a couple of the other findings. Uh, finding four, reporting of vendor transactions to cooperative purchase agreements. This That's finding three. Sorry, <laughs> finding or item three. Item three, finding four, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, using or reporting cooperative agreements uh, to those cooperative agreements. So when we purchase off a cooperative agreement, there's a requirement to um, report that, or if a vendor purchases <coughs> off, sometimes the vendor has to report that, and it's just the college's duty to monitor that. And while we found that there was some progress made, both from a standard operating procedure and overall review, we did find some, um, some that weren't done as timely as they could have been. And so, again, just a little bit more time to mature that process and let it, um, be in practice as a normal course of business. Can you, Adam, can you I'm sorry, let me, sure. can you elaborate on, on the definition of commodity codes? Commodity sure codes, that is. so commodity codes are a, a numeric number assigned to a specific set of goods. Paper has a specific commodity code. Okay. And we have rules on purchasing that if we purchase over a certain dollar amount, I think it's $50,000, that we have to, uh, have some other purchasing procedures, whether it's quotes, bids, mm -hmm. when we purchase commodities. And so when we assign commodity codes, we can then easily sort the purchase orders by commodity code and determine how close we are to getting to those thresholds. So that's the okay. purpose. I just want to get an idea where we're Okay, thank you. Item four, which is finding five, uh, formal delegation of authority. Right now the college has one level of purchase authority that resides with executive team members and as a matter of best practice and layered controls and a layered approach is to have multiple layers of approval based on uh, authority levels and so certain people in certain departments would have uh, other thresholds of approval that would then escalate up to executive management that would take some relief off of exe executive management for reviewing the, the levels of purchasing that have to occur. And right now that is um, started to be in place. Uh, however, it does also need to have some further um, completion and, and 
filling out of that authority matrix is, is how that's delegated and so uh, it's just more time to fully vet and determine what those appropriate thresholds should be throughout the college so that that can be then rolled out uh, for the active purchasing environment. What is the threshold right now before it comes to the board? I don't believe there are many thresholds right. before it comes to the board oh, as sorry. far as contract levels. I thought it was. I was thinking there was too. Certain contracts over a certain point don't require coming to the board. Maybe we could get that answer for next month when we have a contract. Yeah, let us focus. <clears throat> We're going to have that very discussion next month uh, with the contracts review. Moving on to item five, funding six, contract renewals and the timely initiation of the renewals of those contracts. Uh, we did find that there has are procedures in place. It is a manual process now to track contracts, and that is a bigger discussion for the college uh, in with the contracting uh, cycle and the contracting function and contract management. Uh, but right now it is a manual process that's been implemented um, with the manual process. We did also find some errors when we did some detailed testing. So uh, just to accumulate all the various contracts in a manual system is taking some time. And so the, the purchasing department along with contracting and contract management needs more time to fully complete that list and really actively manage and monitor those contracts so that we can have them renewed on time to prevent breaks in service. Finding eight, the monitoring of the vendor list. Uh, I have a question oh, on that yes. one. So is there any plan at all in the, uh, for there to be a, a, a software tracking yes, for I mean, contracts? There are, yes. and um, when we finish presenting the findings, management's going to be able to come up here and, and provide you their responses okay. for these remaining open items. And so uh, I know that's part of their plan that they'll discuss when they come up. Finding eight, the monitoring of the vendor list. And so uh, as a best practice, it's um, for purchasing to manage your, your vendor list, manage the college's vendor list to determine where vendors might be. Um, stale vendors is a, a word we use or inactive vendors that haven't been used for a while and to clean that list up. Uh, they have started that process. Uh, we did still find some uh, vendors when we performed our testing that need to be uh, also deactivated or, or made inactive in the system. Um, purchasing has started a quarterly purge and they need a few more quarters to be able to catch up and complete that cycle to make sure that your vendor list is current and maintained well. Finding 10, uh, the, the formal monitoring of split uh, and se sequential and serial purchases. This is where commodity codes comes in is to help monitor those different purchases and also this activity also make sure that you don't circumvent other purchasing rules. Uh, management has implemented the <coughs> process to do this. Uh, it was originally intended to be a weekly process when we went in and performed it, or performed our testing to, to verify if that was occurring weekly. Um, it was not weekly is, is really too many times a month or too, too frequent of an occurrence. And through our consultation with management, we advised that a monthly review would be a better <coughs> practice. It's more achievable uh, and frees up the team to do other purchasing activities. And so that is part of their plan is to move that to a monthly and there will therefore can have be performed more consistently throughout the year. Finding 12, uh, user profiles and access restrictions. This falls along with uh, 13 uh, and also item one that we discussed, um, defining user access within the system so that uh, people have appropriate restrictions within the system to perform purchasing functions. Uh, the purchasing department has reviewed all their users and made corrective action on those user profiles and their access. There's some other profiles within business office and within the IT help desk that are still under review and those still need to be cleaned up before <coughs> the, that finding will be completely <coughs> remediated. <coughs> Overall, our summary recommendations are just a, in, in a nutshell of what, we've, what I've just discussed is they need more time to go through and further execute the remediation practice. Um, they are, are doing that. Uh, further restricting user access with segregation of duties, uh, further purchase <coughs> orders, implementing standardized, consistent, um, reviews, 
also making sure that those reviews and occurrences happen in a timely manner, and then uh, having uh, more consistent use of the commodity, co commodity codes are what our recommendations are for further improvement to, f to completely remediate all the findings. Um, as I said, we, in our report, as management to respond and before, provide Before we go on there, I want to go back and take questions uh, before we get into management, because while you guys are up there, I want to talk to you all first. Uh, <clears throat> I've got a question, but let me kind of set this up. Maybe this is as much to remind myself and make sure I'm understanding what's in the packet. The original audit was done in 2017, I think Mayish, if I remember right, was that accurate? Towards okay. the end of the year, yes. Um, Follow-up was done um, uh, a year later, nine months later. Um, you found um, of the original 13 findings, five of which were high rating, four of the five or four fifths were only partially remediated of high risk areas, correct? Correct. correct. And five of the eight of the moderate risk areas were not remediated. So nine of the 13, well over half, were still only partially remediated on a follow-up audit. Right. <clears throat> that doesn't seem normal to me. Seems like it's running a little slow to get, I mean, particularly high-risk areas. Um, yes. Purchasing's a basic function. It ought to be operating like clockwork. So what's, what's going on? So what we found in all of our follow-up procedures, the others that we discussed at the last <coughs> trustee meeting as well, is that um, the, the, these audits are very much a first time full deep scrub of compliance and process and either use of automation or lack of automation. Um, and our recommendations typically have automation in them in order to quickly remediate the risk that's in our finding. There's usually a two step process. There's a manual procedure that has to be put in very quickly because there's risk and then there's a longer term procedure that needs to be put in that's automated. Um, as it relates to purchasing, the focus on management's response was very much around automated processes because of volume. And we agree with that. As internal audit, looking at many purchasing functions for <coughs> um, public organizations, volume is very high and it's unpredictable. And so um, when I presented the audit to you last year, some of the dates to which management had committed to have corrective action had both two dates as well as some further dates out into the future because they were trying to get automation. We didn't wait a year, 18 months to come do follow-up procedures. We wanted to come in and make sure that the, that the manual procedures and the progress that had been committed on the short term had been acted on. And so we anticipated that of the findings, there would be many that had partial completion. So this was not a surprise to us. Potentially, I should have queued it up that way to you, but it wasn't a surprise to us based on understanding what the risk is, the um, corrective action, be it manual or automated, and then knowing that automation, segregation of duties, access is also tied to other functions and other responsibilities that we know are being um, formalized in the college. So it was not a concern to us. But what is a concern is if we were in here talking about they, that, ma that the management team or the procurement department was waiting for automation, so nothing was happening, and the risk was letting stagnate and, and nothing was happening. So we, we got comfortable that activity occurred. We also would tell you that even in some of the, the early audits, and I think Dr. Escamilla would agree, um, the staff is a little ambitious as to how quick they can make change and implement change. Um, and so what we found in many of these cases, you'll, you'll read that it's not consistently applied. So there are decentralized functions within pur pur purchasing. Those out in the college have to comply and, and participate. <coughs> so that, that inconsistent application doesn't mean no application. So we, our words are very, we, we, we select our words very carefully to be able to be, to be clear. Um, if we had no application, it would just be open. And so I, I, I do want to make sure that it's okay. a fair, accurate depiction of what we found and whether it met our expectations. Okay. So a summary would be you came and expected to, to see partial progress and you found partial progress. Did you have as much partial progress as you hoped to find or would you like to have seen more partial progress? I think that um, there are, th there is, is some area 
where um, you have centralized control in purchasing, like a delegation of authority, that more progress could be made by pushing, pushing action through. Um, but there are fewer of those. When you look at these nine open items, um, there might be one or two in, in that case. Um, and of the things that, that are, the, particularly they're high risk, uh, that yeah. still need some attention, is there any major risk that needs to be advanced further, needs to be remediated, covered, completed further, quicker than any of the others? <clears throat> or is it solely based upon what's categorized as high risk versus moderate risk? I think I, think I would focus on the high risk. Um, so I'd like to point out in your report, we have updated management responses that have dates to them. And so one of the things we pay particular attention to is, so when, are, when is it going to be finished? You know, that's a particular, a particular interest to us. And in the mo in, for the most part, um, we're looking at fall, August, September on what, all of these what items. What page are you on? So if you, oh, did you want Page 13 is a, a good example, finding 12. This is user profiles and access restrictions. Our page 13 is discussion, so somehow. I'm sorry, page 13 of our report. So um, in the detailed report that you have, can you, you have a up? copy of, I'm sorry? Can we pull it up here so maybe we can match it? The same page. Yes. Thank you for being so responsive. So, yes. yes that's, yes. that's the correct. So, if you'll see uh, just, just above the last paragraph, that. we have management's updated response. If, you, if you'll scroll up just a moment, you'll see that the finding is finding 12. Just a little more, please. So, right there at the top, finding 12. User profiles and access restrictions. Now, if you'll go back to the bottom, you'll see management's updated response, who's been assigned responsibility for facilitating that change, and then also the implementation date uh, is represented to be October 2018. So, where it says management response, that's actually management's updated response? Correct. That okay. is their updated response to, to the, that particular it's in this in this audit, right? To the status of being partially remediated right. for this audit. And so they're saying the final implementation of the user access will be completed by October 18, monitoring by September 18. So that leads into really probably at least the one other question I had, and that is based on what management has com uh, committed to doing, are you comfortable with that time frame? So I'm com we are comfortable because we accepted the time frame. So we're comfortable with the time frames that are existing in here. They're August, September, October, and one of them is December. So they, they stagger through the fall semester. Um, the, the time frames will occur. We have confidence based on our current status that they will occur and what you'll hear from management's commitment. The August and September are on track and so we've been keeping pace with that. Um, and then we would expect to come in February and do follow-up procedures to verify that they have been fully remediated. So the short story is we're doing okay and we shouldn't as a board because audit is an ultimate governance function, right? We shouldn't be concerned until February, until the report's back from February. And if it's still, things are not remediated after February, is that when we should be addressing Dr. Escamilla about that? Yes, I would say that Dr. Escamilla would know in advance of- I'm gonna say, uh, we're not gonna wait till February for anything. For the, <laughs> yeah. Nobody will be surprised. No, but we February. won't know as the board no. until you've tested it. So if we come in February, you'll tested. hear from us likely in April. Mm -hmm. We'll take our, our, do our procedures, write our report, you'll receive a complete briefing in April based on what we found mid spring semester. And before you receive that report, Dr. Escamilla will understand the status and closure. And if there is not closure, then that would have already been elevated to him. And so that concern would, would happen before you received that briefing okay. was what I was, where I was going. But your and, expectation is that there'd be full remediation at your report in April. Yes. Did I get that right? Okay. Yes. And and the the item that has the longest time frame is this delegation of authority escalation. Um, that that while that's a management decision, it also is a cultural change. And so I would I would I would be cautious if it was too quick of a change, knowing where we are right now. We have a new CFO. We have other things happening with our ERP system. Um, and so I thought de December was appropriate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I, I think I'm not surprised uh, that we have some mediation because they have not had a head man for several, several months. And, and I'm not surprised either that 
they are so proactive and want to get things done well and very aggressive with what they're doing. Is there any place, uh, and how you all did that, it's miraculous <laughs> because it, it just is having to work with so many personalities. Uh, but uh, primarily, and I'm sure, Mr. Garcia, this will come to you, but we should always know that if there is a place where it gets to the point that you need some more help, is that part of the issue? Can it be part of the issue and the resolution of these things? So I fully understand, and like I, I'm not surprised, but um, I do want to thank the organization for the work that they have done when they have not had somebody at the head of the table. So uh, thank you, and I know that knowing these people that they will get everything done in time. Before we move into management's response, any other questions about the audit findings? I've, I've got a question. Sure. Please, Ed. Just a minute. Do you read the report to the nations? I'm sorry? The report to the nations issued by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay, I, I read it as well. Uh, the combination of these weaknesses concerns me. It looks like we are very vulnerable. We just passed a $100 million budget. But in addition to that, we've got 300 approximately million dollars of capital expenditures. So we've got a lot of money running through that purchasing department with multiple weaknesses that the combination of some make us very, very vulnerable. Do we have compensating controls in there? So the reason that purchasing was looked at in 2017 as the third audit that we performed, period, was because of what you just said. The exposure exists. Risk exists. Our audit identified over 30 controls in the actual audit report, for which you didn't receive because you weren't on the board at the time. Um, that audit definitely was used to get comfortable with the cycle and the layered control environment. So the actual performance of the audit addressed those risks and concerns. The 13 findings, while there are 13 findings, many of which are interconnected between user access and segregation of duties, was not an alarming number of findings considered, considering the scope of that audit. And that's what I presented a year ago. So, yes, we have some open exposure, and I don't disagree as internal audit. That's why we came in and performed follow-up procedures. That's why we're taking it seriously. That's why we talked to Dr. Escamilla about it. Um, but I would also tell you that the original report had a um, satisfactory rating on all but one of the objective, objectives because of that. The only objective that wasn't satisfactory had to do with access and segregation of duties. And so we're very well aware of that exposure and it is being addressed. It, it's my impression, and I might have the, the percentage wrong, but I'm not wrong by much, that governmental organizations lose approximately 5%. 5% is the, no, is the number, right. So that means that with controls in place, they lose 5% of their revenue, their gross revenue with controls in place. We have weaknesses. 5% of any one of those numbers I said earlier is a huge number. So I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, based on, on my knowledge and background, I, I'm concerned. Uh, and, and I understand you're an internal auditor. You're doing your job. Yeah, but, I, I mean, and our job was to look at the, at the controls. I, I just wanted to make sure you had the background because you weren't here for the actual report briefing. Yes. I will add that when we do look at some of these findings and we realize that they're not fully remediated, we still go ahead and do some testing to determine if any things like errors or fraud could occur. And so if you look on uh, page eight of the presentation, so that's finding 10, you'll see that we included during our testing, we actually looked for split serial purchases, instances where that would indicate a potential fraud or because that, that's what you're talking about. We didn't identify any. So we actually went and performed testing, selected a statistically based sample, performed testing, and did not in, find anything within that. It doesn't mean that there's the control in place, 
but it means by manual practices that things are occurring as they should based on our testing. Also, I would like to say that these are just open findings. That doesn't discount the testing that we did in our prior report that all came out positively, which happened to do a lot of making sure purchases were approved correctly. We, we're not following up on those findings because they weren't findings. So there are other compensating controls in place that we have tested and validated. Um, doesn't completely mitigate what we're talking about today, but there are other procedures in place. I, I just think we need to expedite getting this all corrected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other question? Yes, please. So from a process standpoint, you all report to us working with management and, and incorporating into your reports the management response and the timetables for remediation um, so that we don't have to keep pending lists. Uh, I'm, I'm curious as to the process, if those, if those activities, um, you're going to come back and test them in February and report to us in April. That's what I think I heard you say a second ago. Is there any way without us keeping our own pending list that we find out if those things are not occurring? And, and Delia keeps a pending list for us of, of, of agenda items to come before the board. So, so I just want to know a little bit about process. Do you communicate directly to our board chair if, if there is a concern between meetings? How does that process work if things so, are... So, yeah, let me answer that. So um, I'm not as, asking it clearly, so good luck answering it. <laughs> no. So as internal audit, uh -huh. we are a, a validation point. You know, we kind of come in, see if what management's asserted is ready, is ready, and if it's being consistently operating. So yeah, it might be ready. They may have put a new procedure in place, but especially one that's decentralized, is it consistent? That might be news to them too. It's, it's, it's benefit, beneficial to those who own the process to know how compliant it is. So we are a point in time, um, typically it's 90 days after the completion of remediation because we want about a quarter for it to live and operate before we come in and test. So we are not a touch point for interim management's assertion to you that they're on track. Dr. Escamilla is in his cabinet meeting and in his briefings with his team verifying that they've got their audit results, they're working on it, is everything on track, is there anything we need to know that, that delays us. And you know, last year we, we had some things, we had some staff turnover, we had some new priorities that, that, that he's aware of. So I would, I would say Dr. Escamilla, you are that touch point. Um, we do inquire and find out if there's any changes and are we still on track for us to come in and you know be ready to be tested um, but it's it's kind of like you have a diagnosis you take your medicine you get retested so the take your medicine and the touch points with um, with your own personal health care is this the same as that's the best analogy I can give you of this process so it's the leadership team and Dr. Escamilla touch points along the way. So given that concern, we probably ought to then have a report internally about this issue before April of next year to address some of the concerns. We, we want to know internally where we are in the remediation before April of next year. That's, that's what I was saying earlier. You'll know long before February a uh, health checkup along the way, especially if there's something just uh, there's something that we couldn't overcome for some reason, and we, we identify it, say, in November, uh, we would certainly bring it back uh, more quickly. But what the point is, uh, good health or bad health, whatever the situation is, to use the, the analogy, uh, we're going to bring back a, a report, and that'll be through uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Tammy McDonald and, and myself. So let's put this on as a pending item. Uh, what I'd suggest is let's put the first one on for September 30th, because that's partially some of them will be done, just an interim. And then we could do it, decide at that point whether we want to do it every few months or whatever. But, yeah. I mean, you're, you're picking up on a concern. Yeah. Uh, it's not a matter of distrust. It's not that people are not working hard and doing what they need to be doing. But, but we've been concerned for several years about risk and not being audited. And we're just off to a slow start. And I would say, Trustee Scott, we do keep a tracking <coughs> list. We know what's closed and open. And we have management's assertions to us about when things are supposed to close out. Um, and we are talking to, to, to Tammy on a monthly basis about that. 
Um, so we are tracking, but that's different than giving you confidence that we're validating the assertions that management's making. Okay, you know, our team is done, we're ready to go. I do think it's worth hearing from um, purchasing on this mm -hmm. particular topic so you can, can understand their commitment. I think that would be appropriate if, this, if that's okay. Sure, great. Who's going to address that? Is that going to be Raul again? Okay. Hey, by the way, welcome again to the college. <laughs> <laughs> that for timing, very nice. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you and your team uh, for your recommendations and your report. It's, it's very informative, and it's going to allow us to continue to improve our operations. And the timing could not have been perfect. Obviously, we just received $110 million in bond funding, so it's very important that we firm up our business practices. And so, just in general, uh, as I reviewed the report, the approach that I, that I came about with uh, in terms of remediating these audit findings <coughs> is, is really uh, is designing our controls around three things. It's people. I, do I need to train? Do I need to develop? Do I need to coach our people? Second item is process. Do I need a standard operating pro procedure? If it already exists, do I need to fine tune or redesign the procedure? And then the third piece is technology. Obviously, you had mentioned that some of the audit findings ha are very technical, very complex, and high in volume. So that's when we start to try to take a look at our technology, and hopefully there's a technology solution to do a quick fix. Uh, some of the items have been addressed either in a short-term solution, but we're also looking at it a long-term solution. Okay, so there's, uh, I think there was mentioned that there was a total of high-risk items, so I want to touch on those uh, to be sensitive at, of your time, and then we can open it up for any additional questions that you may have. And so out of the five high-risk items, four have been partially remediated. So um, I'm going to ask you to, uh, as I move along, to look at the audit report, and I'm going to reference the specific audit findings and talk about how our approach to remediating those issues, okay? Uh, the first item is number five. It's a high risk, lack of formal delegation of authority. That is on page seven. We're going to find it on the screen as well, Mr. Garcia, back there. Okay. All right. So if I understand this audit finding, this was a, a two-part audit finding. Number one, it's referring to the purchase order as well as contracts. And so I think we've already come up with a solution with um, authorization levels, bifurcating the authorization levels uh, for purchase order. But now, I think someone brought up a very good point. There needs to be collaboration with other units. So I now need to have a discussion uh, with some of my colleagues. Oh, <laughs> hey, Demi. <laughs> this is ours together. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, and thank you, Tammy. Yes. <laughs> So there needs to be collaborate, collaboration with some of the other team members to get their perspective. So this is part of the assessment and say, how can we fix this collectively? You know, what are the different levels of authorities for the contract piece, which is the last piece that's missing in this audit finding is my understanding. So we do have a recommendation. That recommendation is driven by some of the best practices designed by some of our sister organizations in Texas. So I have not taking a deep dive as of yet, but you know, the timing is perfect. I wanna take a closer look at that and then have a conversation with some of my peers here on the team to see what, um, to gain their perspective. Okay. So uh, this is gonna take us, I think, into, uh, I think we said our deliverable is going to be December 2018 when we can fully execute the bifurcation of the approval of contracts. And then, so that's a, a quick, short-term manual solution. <coughs> the other thing that I've seen at some of the organization is the P2P technology solution. Purchasing all the way through payment and doing that all digital, because it just saves time. You're able to have the tracking mechanism as to the status of that. 
but I don't want to introduce any new technology at this point in time, only because we're looking to explore a new ERP system, which I believe we may be going out um, within the next. We, we, we're within a year from launching that process to, sure. to build the very thing that you're talking exactly. about. So, so part of the strategy is not to introduce any new software applications that would be in conflict with this new ERP system. Let's first find out what the ERP can do for us and then determine whether or not there's a solution attached to that. If not, then let's see what's out there as well that complements our ERP system. So again, looking for that added value in our new ERP system before we introduce any new software. Okay? okay. Any questions on that? I said our, our short-term solution, because this is something that crosses over into both of our areas, so the short-term solution is have a manual process put in place that's formalized in writing. We have an informal manual process right now, but for it to be considered remediated, we have to have that formal process. And then the long-term solution, like uh, Mr. Garcia said, is to have this be electronic. So either through a new ERP, or if the ERP does not have the capability, then we will look for a, a, a separate piece of software that can help with the piece that purchasing needs, but also track contracts and do the what we call contract administration piece also. Well, let me just make sure I'm clear though. Even though it may take longer, you're still gonna get the basic risk mitigated and covered and procedures properly working the way they are now, where they should be now, even without technology, correct? Short term solution okay. is manual. Yes, it's gonna be. That's, uh, that's the bottom line. By December. By, by December. By December, yes Got sir. It. <clears throat> yeah. The next high risk item, is my understanding, is uh, number eight. Uh, out of finding number eight on page nine. We got it up. It's all ready for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right. So, um, vendor list not monitored. And so, what we have here is. Um, So we have a list, a big list of vendors that we've used over the history of this institution. And if I quantify it, it's about 4,956 vendors in our vendor listing. And so uh, our approach is going to be to deactivate, not delete, but deactivate those vendors who we have not had any transactions in the last two years. And then as we incur or get any new contracts or any requests, we're gonna activate it uh, on the system and we'll do our, our due diligence, obviously, to make sure that it's a valid vendor and, and that, uh, that the services provided are up to par to our standards. You know, the, the typical due diligence in any purchasing process. So I just received a status update. IT is being engaged. And so they'll be coming up with a, a technology solution where they're gonna be able to not only give us a report of what that vendor looks like, but they're also gonna be able to automate this process because think of the volume, right? 4,956 records to go on there and deactivate each one is just not effective use of our time. So this is where we leverage technology. IT is gonna be able to come up with a query and say, Here's, here are the parameters, and let's flag them and then say deactivate them. And hopefully, if I'm lucky, uh, and I'm sure we're good at it, we should get that done. Uh, I think I said, uh, and what is my recommendation? I think it's on the next page. September 21st? Is that uh, no, this December 28th, but we're going to exceed those expectations just based on uh, the status update that I've heard today. Well, so. and, it, and it's three parts. So okay. just to be clear, you have yes. 3,000 dormant vendors that just need to be inactivated. Mm -hmm. That's one part. That's the easy part. The next part is the monitoring piece. And so putting something in place for the monitoring piece is what takes time between now and December. Yes, yeah, so, so, so you, you, you brought a very good point. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the things, one of the design solutions is process. So not only are we gonna do this one, one time, but we're also gonna, gonna institutionalize a process where we're gonna look at all the vendor lists on an annual basis and then deactivate those vendors that, that frankly we're not doing business with. So I think that'll resolve 
the yeah, issue. Yeah, we need both both pieces done, which is why December yeah. was appropriate from a time frame. Okay. I have a question yeah. on the the vendors coming from a state environment. Yeah. I know that we had to um, deal with the state, and if they weren't current on paying their workman's comp or their taxes or whatever, they were on a state list not to do business with. Is they're comparable for in the community college environment? The same state list is, is reviewed against. So okay. um, the process to requalify is part of monitoring the vendor list um, so there's a the, the the entire process of having vendor acceptance vendor qualification and then being able to keep essentially the vendor list clean is that entire cycle so yes and and to add to the complexity it's not only at the state level obviously we have federal grants and the federal a what used to be a 133 i don't know what it's called today single uh, audit single audit <laughs> super, yes. super circular <laughs> so audit. they have standards that say here's also the standards when it relates to federal dollars excuse me so we need to be sensitive again this is not easy our business is not easy there's complexity because there's compliance all over federal state local so we're, we're going to be sensitive in, in designing our procedures to that all right. Uh, I think the next one is number 12 on page 13. 13. Right? All right. So define user profiles and access restrictions. So, um, so I understand why there's a high level of risk here. Um, what tends to happen more often than not is when, whenever we hire an employee, a new one like myself, they're going to say, oh, give the profile of so-and-so. Give them the access of so-and-so well, without giving too much second thought as to what type of access uh, is re reasonable based on the roles and responsibilities of the individual. So we've had some of that noise a little bit. And what we've done is, number one, is tiered a solution. The tiering approach was, number one, aligning the access to the type of roles and responsibility of the position. Do we give them access or do we give them review? Do we give them uh, change authority? So all of that is factored into the process. <coughs> and when you talk about the number of employees that we have here, it can be pretty extensive, that review and assessment. Well, I can tell you the purchasing department has completed that uh, phase of aligning the roles and responsibilities to the type of actions that we're going to authorize, either viewing or change authority, right? The next step, and so now we're in phase two, where we've looked at the different departments and made adjustments to their access. We're still vetting through some of that a little bit more. So again, the volume and the time commitment needed to do a thorough job at this stage of the game is going to be, uh, is, has taken us a little bit longer than uh, we anticipated. But we're hoping to wrap this up uh, in terms of October 2018 and, uh, and then institute, institutionalize a business practice uh, that starts with designing a report that tells me who has access to the purchasing module and then assessing whether or not they have the appropriate levels of access to that specific module. And that'll be on an annual, possibly rotation, depending on the volume process. I would ask also that there be some part of that process that is automatically done whenever someone changes roles or leaves the institution. So, so that's, or just, to, just to be clear, we have, um, we're kind of overlapping with some of the content of the IT general control audit. Both of these findings will be much more thoroughly discussed when we discuss that. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself there. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on to uh, number 13. Uh, I think that's the last of the items. Okay, that's on page 13. All yeah. right. Lack of segregation of request and approvals of purchase requisition. Similar to one of the previous discussed items where we need to d design our, our, our 
business practice around the the approval process based on roles and responsibilities and then bifurcate based on the dollar volume of, of the transaction. And so uh, I think we've done that piece. And so we've instituted a manual process. But again, I'm looking to leverage a technology solution whereby I can avoid the same person who's making the request of the, on the purchase order authorizing the, the purchase order. Right now it's a manual intensive process, but it would be great if I can have what is referred to in the industry P2P uh, process where it's initiated by one person and then it's uh, a driven, the workflow flow is done digital and it goes to the next person based on levels of authority and what have you. So, so in this case, yes. we, um, we tested specific purchasing department employees and then those people out of the purchasing department that had requisition um, request or approval access. We found many, many restricted. 76 individuals were appropriately restricted. But we had other individuals who could both request and approve um, both within the purchasing department and two outside. So that really just means that um, access review and um, and reduction and restriction of privileges needs to be further refined. And it, that particular piece requires an immediate action. The more process oriented is a longer action. So just to be clear. Okay. Okay. So essentially, to your point, I think we do have controls. This just needs to be refined a little bit further. Is, is that correct? Right. So there's an immediate corrective action that needs to occur on the identified individuals. And then there needs to be, yes, to be clear, a, a process that would have caught that in an ordinary course. Good. Right. Thank you. All right. So that's pretty much it on the high risk items. Uh, I can open up now for any questions that you may have on some of the other ones. Yeah, do you have any questions? I know you've poured over this. Okay, this helps. Okay. I have a question. Please. 76 seems like a very large number of people that can approve requisitions. No. It's not? Um, request or approve, so that's the whole bucket. And we've got many departments, many functions, many programs that need to be able to request purchases. It's not. Well, they may approve as well. I mean, you have, you have a, a department head or um, a faculty director. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not a lot. I mean, in, in my um, humble opinion, <coughs> it is not a lot. Okay. 76 Does individuals who can do one or the other, and um, I don't want to misrepresent how many can do which function, is not a lot. That's not a lot. Not Seems in like lot this organization with, um, as many people as we have. with as many people and as many functions that you have. Yeah. Not in, not in an organization this size. Yeah. It would, it would, I, would be a lot if it were trombones. Just in my humble right opinion, now. I didn't mean to. I, I would start with okay. a teacher, just think, can a teacher do that? And then mm -hmm. you go to your staff, or your head of your department, and then it goes to your other head of your department, and then it comes to purchasing, and then it goes through that process there. So it might have seven right. signatures. I mean, it could. Yeah. So, but so this is at the. people can request, but they do not approve. Correct. The teachers can request, they can request, but they do not approve. Final approval comes to. So, so what I said was 76 who can do one or the other. I, I don't want to misrepresent how many can do one function or the other. We believe that the layered approval process is not the finding. That, that layered approval process is appropriate. It, it, and so I don't want to misrepresent. Okay. Thank you. Great. Other questions? <clears throat> Go back to something I said earlier when we ask about an interim update. Uh, just was asking Dr. Escamilla, as opposed to September 30th, since so many of these are in September and October, maybe the thing to do would be to, to get an update from you, Raul, in, in the November board meeting, just have the progress over September and October, knowing that several are going to come in November, in December, we can get an update then in January, and that'll give us two updates over the next four months to see if we're progressing along and might uh, give the board some comfort in terms of progress, knowing it still has to be <coughs> excuse me, tested and audited by our, our uh, external internal auditors. Would that be appropriate to you? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so, so I do have a question. Uh, and so, in, and so, so for some of these, we're still in the design and execution phase. 
the time frame, depending on the time frame, you still may, my question is whether or not you still may have, depending on the timing of your sample size, whether or not these will be reported yeah, uh, so we, as we would want to test we would want to test 60 to 90 days after completion and, and, and placed in service okay. so that's why i represented february thank you based on earlier yeah. perfect okay. thank you so shall i move on can we go back to my yes <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. question oh sorry. so mr garcia would you would they get it as soon as say okay we've done it let's say september the 15th do you immediately go to testing? No. So you have to wait until everything is done and then you go to testing? We, it is our, it is internal audit's best practice to accumulate findings that interrelate, wait 60 to 90 days before, sent from the time that, that corrective action is put in place so that in the ordinary course of business, the transactions can operate and we can test those transactions to ensure that it's actually in place and operating and can be relied on so in short you know if, if we test it today and I have not really executed my uh, control we're gonna end up with the same issue so it's gonna be important for me to communicate to your team and say this is the date that we effectively implemented or executed this internal control feature or activity Great. other questions I believe we're going to go back now and you're going to talk about the remaining 2018 activities in the 2019 audit plan, or do you have something else before no, we do that? No, that's it. I have two more items, and then... Um, I'm not sure we're on the right screen. We are on the right screen. Okay, that's different than what we have in our package. It is? That's, or we're not... It, we're, those of us looking oh, at online are not in the right oh, place, perhaps. We need page to go 11. to page 11. Yes, that's what I thought. Sorry. That's okay. We are on the right that's report it. now. And we're on the right page. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> The, the last responsibility we have in 2018 for fiscal 2018 is the annual internal audit report. You received this last year. Um, this will be the, the college's second annual internal audit report. It is a required report under the Texas Internal Audit Act. It is a, a specific prescribed format by the state auditor's office. Um, and that report will be provided to you in, at in the end of September in order for you to have it well in advance of its final due date, which is November 1st. It is, um, th there's no difference in this report from last year other than there's an assertion on um, state reporting, state purchasing reporting now. And so this is something that we have to accept, I would assume, as formal action of the board. So it will be on our probably October agenda then. I would assume, yes. So if we can make and, sure we have that on a pending list then. And, and, and this particular report is um, a, a reiteration of internal audit activity for which you've already received and been briefed during the year. Um, it just has a required prescribed format to include the overview of the, of the 2018 internal audit plan, the any non-audit services that, that were performed for which there were none, um, our internal audit quality assessment on behalf of your function, so that would be of, of Weaver, um, a description of the 2019 internal audit plan, which we're about to confirm and, and discuss here in a minute, and then any risk, <clears throat> risk areas that are not covered in your, to, in your 2019 plan that and to why um, those would not be covered, and then a function on your um, the ability for, for the college to receive any kind of fraud, waste, or abuse complaints directly for which Weaver would receive. So that's what goes into that plan, that report. So anything else in the public portion of what you need to do before yes. we go to closed session, please then. The last item is the 2019 internal audit plan. So we had a, a risk assessment. During our risk assessment, we prepared and, and provided to you um, a proposed internal audit plan for three years, 2018, 2019, and 2020. In the 2018 plan, we deferred the grant management audit and the information security limited scope audit. We moved those to 2019. So we have revised the 2019 plan that we're presenting to you today to incorporate grant management and information security uh, for, for the 2019 year. We did not just simply add those two audits to an annual plan of three internal audits. We've been talking this morning about the, the focus that needs to occur on prior audit findings 
making sure that those were remediated and making sure that, that, that the college has actually removed or reduced that risk. And so um, we did not think it was prudent to try to perform five new fresh internal audit areas. That would be more than the college could really absorb this year. Um, there were two audit, two significant process areas that were on the audit plan for 2019. The first of which is contract administration. We know based on our procurement findings that contract administration is being centralized, that um, the contract management function is in play right now to be, um, you'll, you'll, we had the question about whether or not we're gonna have a contract management software. That process is being developed internally to be improved and centralized now. I do not feel as internal audit that it's ready to be audited. And so when we audit a, a, an area, we want it to be in place and operating and we don't think it's ready to be audited. So we, have, we are recommending that that not be audited in 2019. In addition, we had the bursar's office on our internal audit plan, cashiering and collections. We do not think that that's a priority over grant management. We agreed that grant management, or we recommend that grant management that was on the 2018 plan still be audited in 2019 based on the funding. And that the rest of our time be focused on the open findings from 2016 and 17 audits, 16, 17, 18 audits, um, to be able to focus on closure for those prior audit findings. So the plan that you are receiving now removes the bursar's office and contract administration. It adds grant management and information security limited scope that was, that was deferred. And I've articulated on the plans with the separate areas of prior audit that still have open findings. And that includes accounts payable, it includes, which was a, a 2018 audit. Those are new findings. We've not had a chance to follow up on remediation. HR, there was a few open findings left on HR. The financial audit, aid audit, there was only one finding. Admissions, I think there were three or four findings left on that audit. IT general controls, which we're gonna talk about in closed session, and the purchasing audit that we just talked about, those four remaining items. And so we feel like it's a priority to focus on those, that prior, um, the prior audit findings. And so I'm presenting to you a revised internal audit plan for your consideration. Couple questions. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> under grant management, it says timing October 2018. Is that because, is that a typo or is that because you can start work in 18, in October? Yeah, it's like, in, yeah, okay. in 60 days. <laughs> it's time to start working. <laughs> it, gets re it gets reported in 19, so it's counted on the 19 plan. But yeah, the work this is for fiscal year. year 2019, which would be 831-19, correct? So the second question is, um, there's a lot of work follow-up work done in November, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four. Uh, oh, those in November 18th, so that's the same question, still in the fiscal year, got it. And then the rest is in January. Right. So will there be any need to do any follow-up work le or later in the year for some of these things done at the, you know, or if probably not have, in time if, for the August, I guess. If we have open, open findings remaining after November, then we'll have to discuss what the timing of any com final completion is. I think is. what's throwing me is I keep looking at uh, having used to the corporate world. I see 2019 I internal audit plan. I think physically 19. You're really doing calendar year. You're thinking yeah. fiscal year. You so we might want to add that to some of these things. 1231 world. Yeah, we look, this is a 9118 9 through 831-19 is your 19 year. Got it, great, okay. Sorry about that. Questions about the uh, recommendation from internal audit plan? And I, I believe we need a motion for the internal audit plan, is that correct? We, yeah, a motion to, to accept. Accept, yes. and we need to probably can wait till after the closed session to accept the findings for the you could, purchasing because we're gonna come back, aren't some of those tied to the, the IT we're gonna hear in closed There session. are two that overlap, as I've, Right. mentioned, um, but we could do all of the approvals when we return that okay. up to we you. Do. We can even wait on the audit plan at that point. Okay. Anything else before we go into closed session? No, sir.
Okay, Regents, the way this is going to work is we're going to have uh, actually two closed sessions today. We're going to go into closed session first uh, to hear the results of the IT portion that is sensitive from a security standpoint. Then we will come back out and uh, make any appropriate motions uh, to accept all of those, and then we'll go back into closed session briefly for a couple of other items. So uh, if you, those in the room could just hold tight for a second. Let me read this um, required language here. We're going to go to a closed session at 1.26 p.m., under Texas Government Code 551.139, uh, governmental information related to security or infrastructure issues for computers regarding information related to computer network security to restricted information under Texas Government Code Section 2059.055, or to the design, operation, or defense of a computer network and information deemed confidential under Section 552.139B1 and 2, including the Internal Audit Board Report for Information Technology, General Controls of Weaver and Tidewell LLP, with possible discussion and action in open session. Again, at 126, we'll clear the room. Regents, while you take a quick break, and we'll be back in a minute as soon as we get the room secured. We are coming back into open session at 2.43 p.m. Um, uh, having heard uh, under the provisions of the law the, the confidential portions of the uh, IT audit, um, what we're going to need is a motion, I believe, on both the uh, follow-up to the uh, purchasing audit, the follow-up to the IT audit, and the 2019 fiscal 19 audit plan. Correct. They all together or separate motions? It, can they be all together? They can be all together. So, move, so, move. so we have a motion from, and a second, a motion from Gabe and a second from Sandra Messbarger. Any further discussion by the Regents? Thank you all for your continued good work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any public comments on the motion? Hearing none, uh, let's do a roll call vote since there's several things. We, we do have a quorum. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Mrs. Strada? Yes. Mr. McCampbell? Yes. Ms. Barger? Yes. Mr. Rivas? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Yeah. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much and safe travels back. Uh, now we've got to go back into closed session one more time. Uh, uh, so hold tight while we, I read you this. Texas Government Code 551.074A1, personal matters regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, assignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employees, including annual evaluation of the college president and the college president's contract and compensation with possible discussion and action open session. So at 2.44 p.m. we will clear the room again and we'll go into a closed session. It is 2.53 and we're coming back out of closed session. Do we have a motion? I do, uh, Mr. Chairman. Regarding the college president's contract, I move that we approve a 2% raise to his base salary and an increase of $2,500 to the president's allowance effective September 1st, 2018. All other terms, allowances, and coverages remain the same. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion by the regents? Do we have any public comment? Hearing none, uh, all in favor signify by saying yes. Yes. All opposed? Motion carries not only unanimously with great uh, appreciation and pride in everything that you're doing, Dr. Escamilla. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Great. Right, appreciate that. Uh, at this time, I'm going to see if there's any general public comments. Anyone that would like to address the board under general public comments? Okay. Hearing none. Um, Calendaring, uh, is there any, uh, I don't have a calendar in front of me. I know we covered it at the last meeting. Anything that's coming up that anyone wants to highlight at this point? Uh, next board meeting, of course, would be September 11th. Uh, and there's a board retreat on the 14th. So I think everyone's got those down. Great. Uh, we are adjourned at 2.55 p.m. Thank you.